Nivedita, do you want to share the screen? Yeah. So good morning and good afternoon to all. Uh, let's just give a couple of more minutes for people to join. Uh, we'll start this webinar soon. So shall I start? Yes, sir, as far as I'm yes. concerned. <laughs> yes. So uh, welcome everybody to this uh, special webinar. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Nivedita speaking from Delhi. I lead the better treatments uh, strategy at TGI India. Uh, we have today with us Professor Vivekanand Jha, who is the executive director of George Institute, who will be moderating the session. Uh, so you'll be able to put up your questions and answers in the Q&A session. And uh, before we start the webinar, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Um, so I'll, I'll take just 30 seconds. Um, this is a request from Professor Guy. So I'll, I'll try to introduce in 30 seconds. So it's my privilege to welcome today's speaker, who I'm immensely fortunate to count as my mentor, distinguished Professor Gordon Guyatt from McMaster University. So he needs no introduction and uh, to this audience, but I'll still go ahead and give a brief one anyway. So many of you, of course, will know that Professor Guyatt uh, coined the term evidence-based medicine, but less widely known that he and his group were responsible for the development of six-minute walk test into the useful tool that is today. Professor Guyatt co founded the great uh, system of rating of quality of evidence. And over the last uh, few decades, he and his group at McMaster University have introduced and developed the, uh, the concept of MID, which is minimal important difference to help clinicians and researchers interpret health related quality of life measures. So one of the core guiding principles of uh, his work is his focus on patient values and preferences. On a personal note, I can always uh, I can also tell you that He's a genius in demystifying complex methodological concepts. He's a generous mentor to many clinical researchers like me and has guided a number of doctoral students in research methods to have become leaders in their country. So with this welcome note, I'll hand over to Professor Gad. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vedita. You uh, managed to get quite a bit into 30 seconds. Very good. Okay, um, I'm going to share screen then and begin the presentation. Before I do, um, I am very welcome if you have questions or comments or reflections as we go along. Just put them in the chat. Um, Nivetita has been kind enough to say she will monitor the chat. Um, it's, I think, more enjoyable if the, uh, uh, if the interaction even doesn't wait till the question and answer period, but starts during the discussion. So anything that occurs to you, just put it in the chat and I can address it right at the top. Okay, so I'm now going to share uh, and hopefully yeah, you see the presentation, which I will now put in presentation mode. And the final presentation mode, and here we are. So I'm going to talk about clinical practice guidelines 
and particularly focus on issues of trustworthiness and transparency. I'll start with declaring my conflicts of interest. I'm the co-chair of the GRADE Working Group, and uh, not coincidentally, you're going to hear quite a bit about GRADE. I am uh, the steering committee of the BMJ Rapid Recommendations, which are made in collaboration with the MAGIC Evidence Ecosystem Foundation, of which I'm the chief scientific officer, and you'll hear about that. Uh, my financial conflict of interest is that for many years, I've spent a lot of time as a consultant with up to date. So what are we going to do? I'm going to talk about the long standing problems and guidelines, the current pro problems and guidelines, and how those problems can be addressed by adopting standards for trustworthy guidelines and optimally presenting the guidelines. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is something called a cumulative uh, meta-analysis forest plot. It addresses thrombolytic therapy after myocardial infarction. Um, probably many, if not most people here are familiar with this sort of figure, but just to summarize, 1.0 represents no difference in mortality between patients receiving and not receiving thrombolytic therapy. 0.5 would mean a 50% relative odds reduction, 2.0 a doubling of the odds of dying. The dots represent the point estimates as data accumulated and the lines around them, the 95% confidence intervals. The first randomized trial of thrombolytic therapy occurred in the 1950s and enrolled 23 patients. As a result, a small number of patients, a very wide confidence interval. The second trial enrolled not 65 patients, but 42. This is a cumulative meta-analysis. These numbers are, represent all the patients enrolled in all the trials up to that point. Well, by seven trials and less than 2,000 patients, the confidence interval still overlaps no effect but by 10 and 2,500, it no longer overlaps the treatment effect, sorry, the null effect. Um, if we could argue about when the answer was in, but probably most of us would say by 30 trials and over 6,000 patients, uh, the lower boundary of the confidence interval is a long way from no effect. We're getting a very low p-value. And we are probably able to say at this point that thrombolytic therapy reduces deaths after myocardial infarction by about 25%. Did this stop the trialists from conducting trials? No, they continued to. And they enrolled another 40,000 patients after the answer was in. Why did they have to enroll another 40,000 patients, half of whom did not receive the life prolonging benefits of thrombolytic therapy? Well, I think the answer to that question, or at least a major part of it, is on the right slide, side of this slide, which presents textbook and current review recommendations that were being made as these data accumulated. And they tell us that some experts were recommending uh, thrombolytic therapy routinely, some for specific indications, some calling it experimental, and some not even mentioning thrombolytic therapy. If you look at the mid to later part of the 1980s, you see a wide diversity in the expert recommendations right across from routine or not even mentioning it. And it's a decade after the answer was in that finally you get a consensus among the experts about the administration of thrombolytic therapy to patients with myocardial infarction. Here's another example of experts gone seriously wrong. Uh, it is another example from myocardial infarction, the administration of prophylactic lidocaine. 45 years ago, when I was in training and did a rotation through a coronary care unit, every patient who came in the door I started what we called a lidocaine drip, an intravenous infusion of lidocaine. Was there ever any evidence supporting my behavior and clinical practice 
in starting these lidocaine drips, which I was instructed to do by my seniors and attendings? Well, the answer is no. You see here that the point estimates are always on the harm side, increased mortality rather than decreased with prophylactic lidocaine. Well, harm was never proven, but certainly um, as these data accumulated over 20 years, uh, any important benefit was excluded. So my patients who I started these lidocaine drips were receiving harm from the lidocaine, the adverse effects, without any benefit. Did this stop the experts from recommending lidocaine? No. If you look over these 20 years as these data were uh, accumulating, um, the experts were, most experts were suggesting the use of lidocaine, which is what I was giving it, why I was giving it. But in addition, you have uh, quite a bit of expert disagreement, particularly as we were approaching the late 1980s. So messages so far, experts going terribly wrong, both a decade behind the evidence or uh, making recommendations that were contradicted by the evidence. Now, these are old stories. They end about 1990 and something happened in 1990 to change the picture. Experts still sometimes go wrong, but perhaps never quite this badly. And what changed in 1990 was the era of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. They weren't around before 1990, and they played an increasing role in guiding medical practice since that time. So clearly, experts were going terribly wrong if one, <clears throat> if one goes back before the systematic summaries of the evidence. So, um, uh, around 30 years ago, uh, things started to change also in terms of moving from informal recommendations, which is experts getting together and writing articles into literature, to formal recommendations typically made under the auspices of uh, or medical organizations. Well, the, it wasn't much better at first, and one can describe <clears throat> excuse me, one can describe the practice as something called GOBSAT. GOBSAT stands for good old boys sitting around a table. And that was basically the model without uh, any structure or any safeguards against misleading recommendations. The question then, what was necessary to move beyond the GOBSAT approach? And a major event uh, was the, uh, a, the Institute of Medicine in the United States and a document called Clinical Gu Practice Guidelines We Can Trust, um, which was produced in the um, uh, late 1990s and updated in 2011. Well, here is a paper that was published um, around that time. So in March of 2011, the Institute of Medicine issued a new set of standards for clinical practice guidelines intended to enhance the quality of studies being produced. And this paper looked at what had happened. And their conclusion was analysis of a random sample of clinical practice guidelines demonstrated poor compliance with uh, Institute of Medicine standards with little, if any, improvement over the past two decades, and many were still using the GOBSAT model. Well, uh, this paper was published about a decade ago, and things have improved considerably since that time, although the GOBSAT model has perhaps not died yet. So the, what were these Institute of Medicine standards? They suggested 25 items and you can see a list of some of them there. Um, I'm going to present my ideas of what makes a trustworthy guideline or what is necessary. It's consistent with the Institute of Medicines, but a much more succinct presentation of a relatively small number of what I think are crucial items. So what are those crucial items? An appropriate panel, 
systematic review of the best evidence. You've also already heard uh, some of the reasons before we had such systematic reviews, how terribly wrong experts uh, were and how much we need those reviews. Explicit statement of values and preferences and Nivedita was kind enough in her introduction to refer to my work about values and preferences, raising the strength of recommendations and making sure that your evidence summary and recommendations are up to date. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly about each of these issues. So I'll start with the appropriate panel, which includes conflict of interest management. So traditionally, the whole panel was clinical experts. Some authoritative person in the field was uh, picked out their friends and colleagues who they liked and said, let's get together to make a guideline. And this was uh, the heart of the good old boys sitting around the table model. We now recognize that although clinical experts are crucial to have on the panel, uh, we need other folks as well. Methodologists, people like me who are expert in uh, assessing the medical literature and making the appropriate inferences. Frontline clinicians, people who are not experts but are managing the patients for whom the guideline is recommended, who understand the particular issues, practical issues of clinical practice. Uh, guideline panels now um, will uh, include that anybody who's making a serious go and a trustworthy guideline will include patients and possibly caregivers on the panel. And depending on the nature of the question, if you're interested in costs, there may be a health economist or two on the panel. If you're interested in your recommendation targeted more at policymakers rather than at individual clinicians and patients, you will include those. And if there are major ethical issues that may be arising in your recommendation, you might include an ethicist. So uh, not only do you have to include the right people, but you have to deal with issues of conflict of interest that are very prominent in almost any guideline. Um, again, probably 20 years ago, um, organizations started to get the idea that they better pay some attention to financial conflict of interest. And there are many stories of problems uh, with individuals, uh, for instance, making recommendations about drugs, having received large amounts of money from the pharmaceutical industry responsible for those drugs, clearly problematic. There's also been increased interest in the last decade or so in non-financial conflict of interest uh, a subcategory of which is intellectual conflict of interest. And I'll take a minute to explain an exa explain what I mean by that with an example. So a group looked at uh, guidelines for mammography and their objective was the exam of the relationship of conflict of interest to recommendations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so they looked at guidelines for screening mammography in women 40 to 49 at average risk of uh, breast cancer. They searched for all the guidelines they could find, and they examined disclosures and specialties of authors and the publications of the lead authors. They found 12 such guidelines, all of which examined exactly the same or eight randomized trials. So variations in their recommendations cannot be attributed to looking at different evidence. They were all looking at the same evidence. Five of the 12 had a, at least one radiologist member of the panel. Guidelines with radiologist authors were more likely to recommend screen, routine screening, a impressive odds ratio of over six with a small sample size chance can still explain it but a suggestion that radiologists who clearly stand to benefit from breast cancer screening uh, when included on a panel more likely to have a positive recommendation. It was also related to the number of publications on breast disease by the lead author um, that doubled the odds 
and that one uh, attained conventional levels of statistical significance. So how would you classify these conflicts, being a radiologist, simply being a radiologist, or publishing a lot in the area? Well, the first one might be uh, classified as professional conflict of interest, and the second, intellectual conflict of interest. If you've written about it and done lots of articles, you've become an advocate for a routine screening. So uh, guideline panels now, uh, when they're organizations that are really doing the best job, attend not only to financial conflict of interest, but also to non-financial conflict of interest. What, having identified this as a problem, what are the solutions? In the old GOMSAT model, it was simply ignored. Some people believe you should balance it, okay? Take people who are invested one way and are conflicted one way and those conflicted another way. Um, uh, limit the number of conflicted. The Institute of Medicine says you should have less than 50% conflict, financially conflicted. Um, I do a lot of work with the American College of Rheumatology who says following the Institute of Medicine, we want less than 50% conflicted people. A typical American College of Rheumatology panel will have 49% of the people financially conflicted. Good solution? Not sure. Selective exclusion. You include uh, people with financial conflict of interest or intellectual conflict of interest on in the panel. You're making a lot of recommendations they are excluded from recommendations in which they are conflicted. Or say, no conflicted people. Uh, I'm gonna talk uh, uh, later on about BMJ rapid recommendations. Uh, I've already mentioned it when I was talking about my conflicts. We completely exclude financial conflict of interest and limit very uh, extensive limitation of non-financial as well. Or, a variation on complete exclusion, completely exclude, but have panels meet with experts in the field who are conflicted to just make sure that they hear the viewpoints of those individuals. And uh, we've done that uh, quite extensively, for instance, on one guideline dealing with opioid prescribing. So we've dealt with appropriate panel and conflict of interest. We want then a systematic review of the best evidence, including a rating of its quality. What do we mean by a systematic review? What makes a systematic review systematic? Explicit eligibility criteria based on the patient intervention comparator and outcome structure and the methods. A comprehensive search to make sure you get all the relevant evidence duplicate assessment of eligibility and risk of bias to make sure you get the, uh, restrict yourselves to the eligible studies um, and identify uh, problems with risk of bias in the included studies. Conduct, if appropriate, as it usually is, a meta-analysis that generates a single estimate, uh, best estimate of the effect, but does also provide for addressing subgroup hypotheses, which ideally will be made a priori by the systematic review authors. And finally, a rating of the certainty, a synonym for certainty is quality of the evidence. And I'm now going to focus on that last issue, the rating of the certainty or quality of evidence. I'm going to tell you about the approach to rating certainty and quality from the GRADE working group. And why, one reason I feel comfortable focusing on that and uh, think that it's a reasonable thing to do because this GRADE approach is very widely adopted and adopted by a number of prestigious organizations. In the upper left-hand corner, you see that the World Health Organization uses the GRADE approach leading American organizations, the American Thoracic Society and American, American College of Physicians. Electronic textbooks in particularly up to date, the world's most popular electronic textbook has over 10,000 graded recommendations. 
the Cochrane collaboration um, uh, insists that their uh, people who publish Cochrane reviews use the great approach and many others as well. So uh, very popular and widely used. And so if you look at recommendations, you're going to see a lot of use of the great approach. The great approach um, to a certainty or quality of evidence has four categories, high quality, moderate quality, low quality or certainty, and very low. Randomized trials start as high quality or certainty of evidence, but they may not necessarily stay high. If there are problems with risk of bias, lack of concealed randomization, no blinding, lots of loss to follow up, we lose confidence or certainty. If the results are inconsistent across studies and we can't explain it. The concept of indirectness, let me give you an example. I practice inpatient general internal medicine and nowadays lots of my patients are over 80 and now even a substantial proportion are over 90. I try to use randomized trials to guide my care but very few patients over 80 and almost none over 90 who have typically been included in those randomized trials. Can I be as sure that the results of the trials apply to these very old patients as younger? Not really. So the trials in younger patients provide indirect evidence for the older patients. Small sample sizes and wide confidence intervals, we lose confidence because of imprecision, and we also might worry about publication bias. Non-randomized studies or observational studies such as cohort or case control start as low certainty evidence, but they could be rated up even to high, particularly if there's a large effect. So think of hip replacement in osteoarthritis, Think of insulin and diabetic ketoacidosis. Think of dialysis in patients with terminal renal failure. No randomized trials in any of these situations, but because of large or very large effects, uh, we still have high quality evidence about their usefulness. So that's the great approach to certainty of evidence. So um, we have uh, talked then about an appropriate panel about a systematic review of the best evidence, including rating the quality or certainty of evidence. And now we'll turn to the issue of values and preferences. So I'm going to tell you about a study done by one of my colleagues, PJ Devereux, to illustrate the importance of values and preferences. Patients with atrial fibrillation are at high risk of stroke, anticoagulation decreases the risk of stroke, but at a cost of more serious gastrointestinal bleeds. Consider the following situation. Without treatment, 100 patients will suffer 12 strokes, six major and six minor, and three serious gastrointestinal bleeds. Anticoagulation would decrease the strokes in 100 patients to four, eight fewer strokes, four major and four minor. How many bleeds would you accept in 100 patients and still be willing to administer as the clinician or use as a patient anticoagulant therapy? Well, my colleague PJ Devereux enrolled patients and clinicians and asked them that question. Of course, he needed the patients to be able to understand what the uh, what a stroke was. And so he presented a description of what was a minor stroke and what was a major stroke. And he also needed them to understand what it was to have a severe gastrointestinal bleed. And so he provided them with a description uh, in lay language that they could understand of what it was to have a serious bleed. So once again, Here's the question. Patients with atrial fibrillation are at high risk of stroke. Anticoagulation decreases stroke at the cost of more GI bleeds. Without treatment, 100 patients will suffer 12 strokes, six major and six minor. Anticoagulation would decrease strokes to four, eight fewer strokes, four major and four minor. 
question, excuse me, how many bleeds would you, serious gastrointestinal bleeds, would you accept in 100 patients and still be willing to administer or as the clinician or use as a patient anticoagulants? Think about that for 10 seconds or so. Redu reducing, cutting the strokes by eight, four major, four minor in 100 patients. In those 100 patients, how many bleeds would you accept? Well, here's what happened when Dr. Devereux asked his patients and his physicians that question. The physicians had a very flat distribution. Some said, I wouldn't use it, even if there were fewer than five bleeds. Some would accept five to 10, some 10 to 15, some 15 to 20, and even a few more than that, but a very flat distribution. I've asked this question actually probably now in dozens of medical audiences and found very similar results to this uh, almost all the time. So a okay, uh, informal replication of Dr. Devereux's results. But what about the patients? The patients here in red, two thirds of them were ready to accept 22 strokes, or sorry, 22 bleeds to prevent eight strokes. Why 22 seems like an odd number. When Dr. Devereux uh, constructed his study, he was thinking like a clinician. He thought nobody's, gonna, nobody's going to go over 22. If Dr. Devereux had given them the patients a chance to do so, some of them would. The patients are much more stroke averse and much less bleeding averse than are the clinicians. Although, there are a few of them, although two thirds are very stroke averse, you have a few, a small proportion of the patients who are more like the clinicians, more bleeding averse and less stroke averse. What are the messages from this? The messages are, first of all, that patient and clinician values and preferences may differ. And if you accepted the clinician's values and preferences, particularly the ones down here, you would be not, you would be more hesitant to use anticoagulant therapy than you should be when the patients are very stroke averse. That's one thing. A second message is patient values and preferences are similar most of the time, but not all of the time. So you have, do have some few patients who have values and preferences more like the clinicians um, and are more bleeding averse. Bottom line, you cannot make recommendations that involve trade-offs between benefits and harms, as almost all therapies do, without taking into account values and preferences. So um, uh, for, for antithrombotic therapy is a great example of the necessity to consider values and preferences in atrial fibrillation in the example that I just told you. But in any antithrombotic therapy, we're always trading off um, reduction in thrombosis with increase in bleeding, the burden on the patients of therapy, and the associated cost. And it is inevitable that to make, if to make a recommendation, you have to, when you're training these off, you have to say, how bad is it to have a thrombotic event? how bad it is to have a bleed and make some judgment about that to, um, uh, to uh, make a recommendation. Uh, I chaired the decade or more ago now, chaired the uh, ninth and last iteration of the American College of Chest Physicians Antithrombotic Guidelines. And we were explicit and said that the value of, that we think the, typical value that patients put in an MI, a venous thrombosis and a GI bleed are similar and much less important to patients in the data driven by the data that I just showed you than it is to have a stroke. Here is an example of an explicit value and preference statement which we think guidelines should do. I'm doing a lot of work with the WHO on their COVID guidelines. And here is a statement from the WHO 
for the COVID guidelines. Most patients would be reluctant to use a medication for which the evidence left high uncertainty regarding effects on the outcomes listed above. This was particularly so when evidence suggested treatment effects, if they do exist, are small and the possibility of important harm remains. In an alternative situation with larger benefits and less uncertainty regarding both benefits and harms, more patients would be inclined to choose the intervention. And these values and preferences led the panel, for instance, when looking at ivermectin, which at the time was quite popular, made a recommendation against use of ivermectin and said it should only be used in uh, uh, the randomized trial situation. That follows from these values and preferences. A different values and preference statement could have said, we place a high value in uh, uncertain benefits that may be there and a low value on avoiding harm, burden, costs, and so on. That would have led to a different recommendation. As it turns out, evidence is emerging that perhaps this was a good idea since ivermectin is probably useless. So um, moving now, to further to the recommendations. You've got your systematic review. You've got your hopefully high quality, excellent grade related summary of the evidence. You now have made explicit your values and preferences and the panel is now in a position to make a recommendation and judge its strengths. So in the great approach, recommendations can either be strong or weak, otherwise known as conditional. Strong recommendations, benefits clearly outweigh the risks, uh, burdens, and costs, or vice versa. Weak recommendations, we're not so sure. Issues that a panel needs to consider using the great approach to making a recommendation and judging its strengths include the magnitude of the benefits and harms, the quality of the evidence, value and preferences as we've illustrated, and they may also consider when it's important, isn't always, issues of cost, equity, feasibility, and acceptability. We like lots this dichotomy of strong and weaker conditional recommendations. We anchor it in patient values and preferences. A strong recommendation would mean that all or almost all fully important informed patients would make the same choice. A weak recommendation because of uncertainty in the evidence or because of variation in values and preferences when there's a close trade-off, the choice would vary appreciably between patients. That has implications for interaction with the patient. A strong recommendation if the patient has got, if the panel has got it right, all or almost all patients would make the same choice. Under those circumstances, you can just inform the patient. Here's what I think you should do and here's why. A weak or conditional recommendation, it means that the choice that if a panel has got it right, the majority would choose the recommended course of action, but a minority would not. And under those circumstances, to get it right, you have to do a shared decision-making exercise. A decision aid, which I'll talk a little bit more about, may help you. Uh, and the classification of strong and weak recommendations also bears on quality of care criteria. A strong recommendation is a candidate for quality, quality of care criteria. A weak is not, because the right thing to do differs between patients. So finally, recommendations need to be up to date. So um, lots and lots, in fact, most now, recommendations produced by prestigious organizations quickly become up to date. They get a panel together, they make a whole set of recommendations. Everybody's exhausted at the end of it. Uh, they go off, they do it again two or three years later. And in the meanwhile, new evidence comes in that makes many of the recommendations obsolete. What's the solution to that? Identify practice changing evidence, conduct a rapid systematic review, including the new evidence, recruit a panel uh, quickly, follow trustworthy guideline procedures, 
right people in the panel, exclude conflict of interest, um, and produce what people have called living guidelines. And there's a lot of interest now in living guidelines. Um, a model for living guidelines has been produced in a collaboration between the British Medical Journal and uh, one of the groups that I'm associated with, the MAGIC Ecosystem Foundation. MAGIC standing for making grade the irresistible choice. Uh, the first of these BMJ rapid recommendations was produced in September of 2016. It was a recommendation on transcatheter versus uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. Note, we did a systematic review, not only of the randomized trials, we did a systematic review of prognosis and a systematic review of all the studies looking at values and preferences, which you've seen how crucial those are, and then ultimately produced a recommendation that suggested, particularly in older patients, the transcatheter approach uh, was, uh, was for most and for the very old, probably virtually all patients, a superior approach than traditional surgical aortic valve replacement. So um, uh, I'm now going to tell you a bit about um, the WHO guidelines, which uh, I'm involved with, and of course have the impression that they meet all the standards for trustworthy guidelines. But I'm also going to show you that they do something else. And this is due to the collaboration with MAGIC, who is working very closely with the WHO um, and is responsible for the format of presentation of the guidelines. Now, we'll see if this link works today. Uh, it looks like it might not. Uh, yes, it does. Okay, excellent. All right. So if you go to this link, you find all the COVID-19 uh, recommendations from the WHO. They are living guidelines. They get updated with new evidence. And here, for example, is a recommendation about use of bonapiravir. So if I click that link, up comes the recommendation for molnipiravir. For patients with non-severe COVID-19, excluding pregnant and breastfeeding women and children, we make a conditional, um, WHO doesn't like to call them weak, they call them conditional recommendations. We suggest treatment with molnipiravir, conditional in those at highest risk of hospitalization. In other words, we think WHO thinks you should use molnipiravir in those at highest risk, but not in those at lower risk. And you can say, so that's some clinicians, that's all they may need to know, but some may be interested in the research evidence. Those who are interested in the research evidence can with a couple of other mouse clicks, go to what are called these summary of findings tables, where for mortality, you have the odds of um, uh, the odds reduction associated with the use of, uh, of uh, molnipiravir. Um, very small effects on mortality because uh, for people with non-severe COVID, which is this recommendation, fortunately, very few of them die. Uh, so I'll move to admission to hospital, a little more interesting. Um, molnipiravir cuts the risk of hospitalization in half. Um, what's really important to patients is absolute effects. So your risk of hospitalization in the average pay, in the average higher risk patient, maybe 6%, it cuts it almost in half. You see the moderate certainty of evidence and you see a plain language summary, molnipiravir uh, probably reduces uh, hospitalization. So um, we can go back. Um, sorry, I didn't do that as well as I should have. But we can go back to our molnipiravir and we've looked at the research evidence. 
we can go to an evidence to decision part of the guideline where we have a statement of the benefits and harms, the certainty of evidence, values and preferences, uh, resources and other considerations. Uh, so you can learn a lot more if you want to, you may not want to. You may ask, what's the justification for this recommendation? You can go to a section of justification. You may not be so interested in that, but you may be interested in practical information such as the root dosage and duration. And if you want to engage in shared decision-making, we uh, the WHO produces decision aids. The decision aids tells, says, well, uh, here, are the, uh, here are the possible outcomes. A patient may say, okay, I'm interested on the effect of admission to hospital. Um, and it will tell you that your risk goes from 35 to 19, 3.5 to 1.9% with moderate certainty of evidence. And patients may have difficulty with these numbers. And so there is a, these are a thousand people. The total there is the 35 and it reduces to 19. Um, here is the patients who will not be hospitalized uh, the colored ones who would have been hospitalized if they didn't receive molnipiravir. So these are what we think, I would say, is the uh, more and more the future of evidence-based medicine, that these structured, layered approaches to recommendations. If all you want to know is the recommendation, you can stop there. If you want these other aspects, the, the detailed evidence, uh, the what how they panel moved from evidence to decisions, their justification, practical issues, and an available decision aid. And that is the way we believe things should work. So I will now move back to this um, and we will finish up um, with some comments about low resource settings. So low resource settings, um, you have a problem. Uh, it's hard to produce these trustworthy guidelines because they involve resources. So uh, you have fees and, and um, uh, the other thing is that the recommendations may differ. Um, low resource settings, cost issues may be important, feasibility issues, acceptability issues. So resources are limited both clinically and for producing the guideline. And the solution may be don't start from scratch, but adapt the guideline. Find existing quality guidelines or systematic reviews. And actually the big resources are not actually in producing the guideline, they're in producing the systematic reviews. So if you have excellent updated systematic reviews, that gets you a long, <clears throat> excuse me, a long way toward where you want to be. Don't, you don't need to adapt every recommendation and guideline because there will be some that will be applicable. Uh, you, so the new local panel uh, picks recommendations where there are applicability concerns about applying them in a low resource or lower resource setting. And then you can adopt the trustworthy evidence to decision process. Construct your panel correctly with experts, with methodologists, with patients, uh, with frontline clinicians, and deal with conflict of interest. And then you can use the great approach that I've suggested uh, where you consider the benefits and harms, the val crucial values and preferences, be explicit about the values and preferences that you're using to make your decision um, uh, and um, uh, consider the context in which you're making the decision. So conclusion, former model was good old boys sitting around the table. We now have standards for trustworthy guidelines. Some organizations come close to meeting the guideline standards but there is still a big problem with time with timeliness. In other words, they come out of they become out of date. Uh, we need living guidelines, and the BMJ rapid recommendations 
presents a trustworthy and timely approach, um, which has now been adopted by the WHO for their COVID guidelines, which is now, uh, uh, I'm honestly very conflicted about the WHO guidelines, um, but um, uh, not only do they produce trustworthy, uh, timely guidelines, but in an optimal electronic layered format that I've shown you. And we think that these could be a model for organizations in the future. And finally, adaptation can make, um, uh, can deal with feasibility issues. Some of the recommendations from high resource settings may not apply to low and adaptation may deal with that. And finally, um, if any of you uh, use Twitter and want to keep up to date on the latest in evidence-based medicine, uh, you might want to follow me um, uh, on Twitter. So uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm now going to stop sharing and I am happy to take any questions, comments, or reflections that anyone has about this talk. Thank you, Professor Bayat, for uh, the wonderful presentation. We do have a few questions in the chat in the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, I just want to let the audience know that if you have still some more questions, do feel free to pop them in. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll raise a few uh, here uh, for you, Professor Bayat. So uh, Professor Arpana Ayangar, who is a pediatric nephrologist, uh, wants to know, how do you, uh, how do you uh, account for patient preferences in, uh, uh, in the children or, or children population? Uh, she says, we struggle to achieve robust grading of evidence. Uh, one of the factors is that evidence is often number driven. Um, well, I am not a pediatrician. So a pediatrician may be better qualified to answer that problem. But obviously young kids um, will, are not in a position to uh, understand the evidence or to make their values and preferences clear. So I would have thought the obvious answer is to look to the parents of the child and the values and preferences of the uh, parents that hopefully come close to representing what a child would say if the child were capable of doing so. Right. Thanks. Uh, we have a few comments from uh, Gohar Ayman, who is a patient representative, and they say, that uh, their experience has uh, generally been uh, positive in developing clinical practice guidelines, uh, but wants to ask the question, how much weight is given to specific studies where there is no work to fill the gap and how far a consensus recommendation is taken? Sorry, um, where the, could you repeat that? What's the question? How, how, much weight, what, how much weight is given to specific studies where there is no work to fill the gap. So uh, I wasn't sure what exactly does that mean no, I, I'm from not, the patient that, perspective. That's, that's what troubled me. I don't, I don't understand no work to fill the gap, but uh, just in general, studies are weighted by their sample size. So you end up with these pooled estimates of the best estimate of the overall effect and bigger studies with more patients and more events get greater weight uh, in the pooled estimate of the effect. Right, and they also ask, what are your thoughts on the patient care perspective, particularly where this varies and perhaps opposes that of other stakeholders? Well, um, it, it comes on the issue of values and preferences, okay? Um, and um, if you ask any, anybody, any group that I've asked to think about it, and you ask them, whose values and preferences should it be? Should it be the values and preferences of the clinicians? Should it be the values and preferences of the panel members? Everybody quickly comes to the conclusion, those things are not such a great idea. It should be the values and preferences of the people who are going to uh, bear the consequences of the recommendation, and that is uh, the patients or our population. So I think, uh, there would be uniform agreement um, that it is the patient's values and preferences that should uh, drive the recommendation. Thanks. So there is one question from uh, Anthony Sanjaya. Uh, what are your thoughts on the use of real world evidence or data, such as the UK Biobank uh, 
or CPRD, et cetera, through a trial emulating protocol that aims to find causal relations. Um, I, so you're talking about large databases uh, that are essentially observational studies. Um, the I, answer is that they are vulnerable to prognostic imbalance. Um, and uh, you will never escape that vulnerability. So just to give you one example, um, beautiful large databases, um, better than the administrative databases. So large uh, observational studies collect data very nicely and showed that uh, people who take antioxidant vitamins have lower rates of cardiovascular disease and lower rates of cancer. Uh, and it's true, people with who take antioxidant vitamins do have lower cardiovascular risk and rates of cancer. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with antioxidant vitamins. When the randomized trials are done, no effect of antioxidant vitamins on cancer or cardiovascular disease. Why, what happened? The people who take antioxidant vitamins are different from the people who don't take antioxidant vitamins. And it's those differences rather than the antioxidant vitamins that is responsible. And that, uh, that uh, is a problem in all these observational databases, which also have problems with the accuracy of the databases in many cases. Um, but you're always, uh, uh, you're never sure whether it's the treatment or if it's difference in prognostic balance. And that is why, and COVID shows us very well, uh, we needed the randomized trials to sort out what was going on. There was no way we were going to find out about the effects of our COVID treatments without randomized trials. Thank you. Uh, another question is around uh, areas in which there is a paucity of evidence, especially for complex interventions in a neglected area like disability. Uh, so when there is there are limited resources and systems for disability inclusive type health. So what advice do you have for those looking to develop guidelines in these areas? Well, um, people are uh, still interested in the uh, uh, in the issues and whether they should use the interventions. So you just have to acknowledge that. You have to accept you're going to find low quality evidence and any recommendations you are going to make um, are going to be uh, weak recommendations or conditional recommendations. Can't get around it. Uh, so you have to accept that from the start and say, okay, and as a result, they're going to be very value and preference sensitive, extremely. When those are weak recommendations, they're always very value and preference sensitive. So you just accept the limitations of your evidence and you live with it. Just one more question, and then I'll ask a couple of my fellow panelists to uh, perhaps put some questions to you. So uh, another question is, what is your take on the representativeness of our current evidence base, where most studies are conducted in the global north rather than many parts of Asia and Africa, but are used to inform guidelines there? Okay, well, um, so um, uh, that is true. Um, to me, it's perhaps less of a problem than some make, you know, because the biology of our medical treatments, um, I presume that atherosclerosis biology is very similar in the South as it is in the North. The biology of various cancers is the same in the South as it is in the North, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, uh, probably less of a problem. Now you're talking about behavioral interventions, that may be different, but for the biologic, the, bio the biology tends to be similar. I should apologize in advance. I did book something at the end of the hour, so I've only got two more minutes. Yes, thank you. So, Shamadip Shalam, do you have any uh, questions or comments to make? Uh, just a quick question. Um, so, this is a problem, particularly in low income country, where you uh, see a lot of duplication of guidelines. So, you will have more than one guideline for a particular condition, and then you also have conflict conditions. So how do you avoid such uh, uh, problems? That broke up a little bit for me. Is the question when you have competing guidelines with different recommendations? Correct. Is that the idea? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, you've got to decide which guideline meets the trustworthy standards, okay? Um, 
you know, look at it. Did they had a, did they use high quality systematic reviews? Did they have the right panel? And did they make explicit their values and preferences? And when you look at that, when you look at it, so that was basically the essence of my talk. Here's how you recognize a good guideline. And, um, and I think you will find when there's different recommendations um, that uh, some of the, uh, some meet the standards of a trustworthy guideline and others do not. Shamadeep, you, you have the last comment and uh, also would conclude the session. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Ganesh, I was wondering if you can tell us about your reflections on uh, complex interventions uh, or in areas of uh, where we know that there is actually a paucity of evidence. So uh, considering uh, these factors, uh, how, uh, like what is the value and utility of making guidelines in those areas or domains of work? People need, guidance. People, people need guidance, right? They have questions, what should we do? Presumably you're going to do, if you do a um, proper systematic review or you have one available um, and you construct a whole panel with, the, uh, with a wide variety of viewpoints, you can still give, uh, you can tell people, you, you, you'll likely say, sorry, we don't know, but here's our best guess with the current evidence. There's lots of uncertainty. And here's under, we, we always make decisions under uncertainty. We're making as clinicians decisions under certainty every day, okay? We can't just say, okay, patient, go away. I don't have great evidence. We have to make, we have to provide advice and guidelines can help us. Okay, apologies again. I really have to run. Been a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank, thank you, you very much, much for that. All right, thanks everyone. That concludes this session. Uh, I'm sure that you all have enjoyed uh, this unique uh, perspective, specifically around the values and preferences and how should guidelines be developed. Uh, we'll, we'll have more of these in the coming uh, weeks and months. So please do stay tuned. Thank you, Nivedita, for organizing. Thank you, Professor Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Shambhi. Bye. Bye.